Stephen, we're delighted to welcome you to the Alumni Gallery and we're looking forward to your insights on the mobile future. Congratulations. Good afternoon. Whoa. <laughs> How's everybody doing? Very good. Well, it truly is an honor to be back here at McMaster, and thank you for the honors and the, uh, the introduction. Um, you said two decades of time of investment in technology. You were being very kind. As I reflected on today, of course, at McMaster, um, this year represents the 25th year since graduating from engineering and management. So I promise I will do my best not to make this the old guy on the stage giving some long-winded bit of information about, about the history. But certainly here at McMaster, um, you know, the, my entire career was somewhat shaped. The engineering and management program gave me the opportunity to learn a little bit about technology, but also to learn about some of the other skills that are necessary in today's business world, and that's the management portion. Thinking about strategy, thinking about people, and all of those things. I do want to reflect on what the tech, state of technology was like 25 years ago on campus, and that related very much to, well, computing. The university then was run entirely on mainframe computers. The first mini computers were just being introduced from a company called Digital that has long since come and gone. Um, I had an IBM personal computer on my desk, and people gathered around when I installed my first five megabyte hard drive. I think of that device. Okay, I promise that wouldn't sound too much like an old guy, but that's what it was like in 1986. But it was interesting because the group of us as students saw an opportunity. We saw an opportunity for a little bit of disruption on campus. Um, unlike today, back then the computing facilities uh, on campus were a bit behind the time. And I know today it's great, but back then they were a little bit slow. Um, and we decided that there were some problems that needed to be solved. The particular problem we were focused on was connectivity. Everyone had all these computers on campus, but none of them could talk with one another. And so we did begin an exercise, as, as Dr. Wilkinson described, to connect the campus. And it took us three to four years, many, many late nights when security had gone to bed, to crawl up above the ceiling tiles, through the steam tiles that rippled this entire campus. And we pulled 22 kilometers of cable over three years, connecting all of these devices. Now, the reason I tell you that story is it was a moment of disruption for the campus because all of a sudden, computers could talk, they could connect, you could take advantage of things that you couldn't in the past. And I'm going to relate that to some of the disruption and everything that you see going on in the entire history of technology. Think about it for a second. Every time a new communications medium is introduced, in the very early days of that medium, what you see is the same as before being ported to the new environment. So let's talk about a couple of examples. Think about the very first movies that were ever filmed. They took a bunch of cameras and filmed what was happening on the stage play and just played them back on film. The very earliest days of television were two talking heads as if they were on a radio show being broadcast live. You think about the cable television industry, the very first channels on cable television were just a redistribution of what was already on the air. The ethernet that we installed at, at McMaster in the very early days was used for terminal emulation so people could connect to mainframe computers. You see this pattern forming, and of course the internet is the same. What you see though over time is that with each one of these changes in communications medium, at a certain point, disruption sets in. There's a moment where people say, on this new medium, I can do things that I could never before do. So think about it. Movies. All of a sudden, with movies, people figured out that they could move the camera at the same time that the actors were moving. And thus, we saw the first Western movies with cowboys and things being chased by the cameras. And all of a sudden, movies were far more interesting than the stage play because the new medium was leveraged in this way. Think about the television. I love Lucy. It's a bit about the dialogue, but of course you can hear dialogue on the radio. But it's very much about the, the gestures, the, the subtle clues that you see as you watch Lucy and Ricardo and everybody else. You, know, the, you all of a sudden saw a disruption in the form of entertainment. <clears throat> the same thing happened at McMaster around the Ethernet. 
It was the case that people figured out, hey, I can share files. I can have parallel computing going on across the campus. And all of these things began to happen. So you see this pattern form. You see this continuing to happen where the new platform is introduced. There's disruption and a whole new wave of innovation takes hold. So let's now talk about mobility and what's happening in the mobile marketplace. It is the case that there have been multiple waves of disruption as it relates to mobile telephony. Nokia has been and will continue to be one of the companies that drives that disruption, drives those forms of innovation. Indeed, for many, many years, we have taken new concepts, like the basic idea that you should be able to move from country to country, or province to province, or state to state around the world, and actually have your device work the same way in all of those places. That sounds remarkable today, but it was only a few short years ago that you couldn't move across Canada and have your device work. So major disruptions and things happen in that marketplace, and Nokia's been a part of that. And that is why today, Nokia is, is the world's leading manufacturer of mobile devices across the planet. It's why countries like China, India, Russia, hold Nokia as the number one brand, that more than any local brand, more than Coca-Cola or anything you might think of. When you go into China, for example, you're greeted by the senior leaders of the government because of the huge impact we have on society there. It's amazing. But of course, in the mobile marketplace, what we have continued to see is a pattern of incredible new moments of disruption. Let's take 2007, for example. Everyone knows what happened in 2007? The iPhone was introduced. Never before had people stood in line like this to get an iPhone. If you look carefully at the picture, David, my son, that's you, sort of just there in the back, because David and I were standing in line for an iPhone. We were actually in Boulder, Colorado, for a friend's wedding, and we're lucky the line moved quickly, otherwise we wouldn't have gone to the wedding. You know, it's just like that's the way it was. And so, why such disruption? What happened with the introduction of the iPhone in 2007? Well, Apple introduced a mobile device that set a new bar in terms of the quality of the experience. They said it shouldn't just be about placing phone calls, it shouldn't be hard to use. It should be a wonderful experience, connecting the device with the cloud, all of these things. That's what they did. They set a new bar, and of course, it's that bar that everyone is fighting today to get above. So they did an amazing thing. But they changed the world with the introduction of that technology. But again, what makes our interest industry so exciting is that pattern of disruption <coughs> continues. Think about what's happened over the last two years with this thing called Android. And for those of you who don't know, this is something, I think formerly it was called an open operating system. They've made some changes in the last 24 hours, taking some of that over this week, which is going to be interesting to see how it plays. But nonetheless, Google introduced this thing called Android. And here's what really happened. Apple had set a new bar and said, this is what mobile technology should be about. And they also said, and we're the only ones who are going to get to do it. Apple, it's close, it's ours. And so they created the conditions necessary for someone else to come in and say, hey, if we give everyone else the opportunity to deliver great experiences on mobile devices through this thing called Android, then maybe people will fall to that in order to compete with Apple. And that is what's happened. Over the last 18 to 24 months, the adoption of this new environment, this thing called Android, has accelerated at a pace in excess of anything anyone has ever seen in the technology industry. So we all talk about the exponential adoption curve and everything. This is no exponential curve. It's far more aggressive than that. So you look at that and say, wow, that is disruption. Now, part of the disruption comes from the ongoing recognition that our mobile experiences are no longer just about hardware or the software on the device. It's also about the ecosystem. The entire collection of search, of navigation, of um, gaming, of music, of all of these different services delivered from the internet combined with that device that defines the future. That is what people are competing on. So we at Nokia used to talk about, well, we're competing with Samsung, with this type of device, and HTC, and Apple, and Motorola, and Sony Ericsson, and all of these companies. But this battle of devices has changed just in the last year or so to a war of ecosystems. Apple, Android, and who else? That was the question. Who else? What's the alternative to that? So I joined 
you know, just about six months ago, September of 2010, and I arrived at a company that's in a position of tremendous market strength. Again, the world's largest manufacturer of devices with huge presence in many regions around the world. Less so here in North America, where it's a bit about, you know, what, what happened to Nokia in North America? What, so people ask that question. And what I did in the days after the ride, actually the very first day, I sent out an email to every employee in the company. And the Nokia group employs 120,000 people worldwide. And I said, I want answers to three questions. What do we have to change? What are you afraid that I might change because you don't want me to? And what are you worried I might miss as I sort of go around the campus or, or around the company and learn? Well, the answer to the third question, in terms of what are you afraid I might miss, the answer was quite common from the thousands of responses that I received. And the answer was, make sure you talk to the engineers. Because for all the layers of middle management, if you want the truth, go talk to the engineers. Find out what's really happening in the company. What's good and what's not. In other words, don't believe all your managers. Just set them aside and the truth. There's a lesson for that. The answer to the second question, in terms of what do you not want to change, there was only one answer that came back from thousands of people. And that one answer was, do not change what Nokia stands for. Because Nokia stands not just for the delivery of great mobile experiences, blah, blah, blah. It stands for doing good in the communities in which it operates, for changing society, for enabling democracy, a whole variety of things. And I'll talk more about that in a few minutes. But don't change the fundament that fundamental essence of us as a company and the impact we have on economies all over the world. Now that first question, what do you think I should change? I got lots and lots of feedback on that one. But there are clearly some patterns that form in terms of the rate of innovation, about attitudes in the company that needed to be changed, all sorts of things that people said, you need to affect these things, you need to make these changes. And so what we actually did in the four or five months leading up to our big strategy announcements on February 11th, is we took the employees through a journey, a very private journey within the four walls of the company. And we talked to them about, hey, we're learning this, you told us that, this doesn't look so good, hey, here are some real strengths upon which we can build, some pluses and minuses and all of that. But about a week before February 11th, I gave a speech to a large number of Nokia employees that was broadcast all over the world. And we had a little metaphor that we were using. And what we were trying to do was to explain to people that you've told us about all of these problems. If you add up all those issues in the context of this industry changing rapidly around us towards this ecosystem play, where it's about Android, it's about Apple, those are the two things to worry about the most. If you add it all up, we're standing on something we could call a burning platform. You may have read this memo. As I mentioned, this was intended to be a very private, internal journey. <laughs> Turns out, this got leaked out of the company. So I gave this speech to talk about the burning platform. And we got so much positive feedback from the employee saying, thank you for telling the truth. Thank you for setting aside the multiple layers of polished PowerPoint nonsense and just giving us the unvarnished assessment of where things really stand. And so when we got that feedback, it's like, you know what? Every employee needs to really hear this, read this, whatever. So one Saturday morning, type, 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 post. A few days later, international firestorm of early platform reports. <laughs> Which is fine. Because in fact, what we needed to do was to set the tone that something fundamental needed to change. Because the story of the burning platform, the real message, and the gentleman who actually jumped off the platform contacted me after this memo got out there. The real story behind this is when you are faced with remarkable circumstances, you have to consider alternatives and directions and decisions that are well outside the bounds of your normal behavior. Why a burning platform? Well, you can stand on that burning platform and chances are you're going down. Like that's, that's a problem. So you have to think differently. You have to consider options that you would never normally have considered. And so for the gentleman who faced this, the option he was faced with was jumping off the platform, you know, something like 20 meters down into the frigid Atlantic water, something you never in a normal day do. I do it in Finland after a sauna, but not here. <laughs> and, um,